How does it feel to be back in Stockholm to receive your second Nobel Prize? I'm not great in social circumstances, and so I feel uncomfortable when I'm under the limelight, and so I, 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 uh, I worry a lot about that, that, but I've done it so often I should be able to uh, say that it's, uh, it, 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 I wish I had, uh, I wish I had more ability to speak uh, what I'm thinking because I have to creep up on it often, and, and so I, 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 I'm not very clear to other people. But that's my biggest problem. People pretend to, especially when you get better known, you know, they, they tend to think, oh, I got to figure this out because, you know, he's obviously very, very articulate and not understanding him or <laughs> something like that. But, you know, my motivation is curiosity. And uh, I started that way as a kid. And, and the motivation was, was the uh, ocean and estuary in New Jersey where I grew up and there's so many creatures and I just spent most of my time in the summer by myself pretty much just digging and catching and finding and searching. And I was trying to find every gosh darn thing that was known down there and I wasn't catching them just to catch fish or something. I was looking for something weird and that's my uh, looking. I uh, always wanted to find something different, new and different. Do you think you were born with that curiosity? My, uh, my father was a hard-working, let's say, workaholic surgeon in Philadelphia. My mom was uh, a very lovely uh, person, uh, just, uh, and she had friends down in New Jersey where she grew up. So we, my sister and my mom and I, we would go to New Jersey anytime we could. And so that was where we were happy. And your mother's happy, I think you're happy too, you know. That's something that occurred to me later in life. <laughs> when mother ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> and uh, so we just loved it. We escaped whenever we could. I got a good education at Quaker School in Philadelphia. So, but, but I'm not sure the things you learn in school really are, are absolutely essential to finding things in the natural world. I, I, I kind of... Uh, yeah, I, I think my experience from, say, four years old up to uh, when, I, when I left around uh, 17 to go to, 18 to go to Stanford, those were the formative years for me being curious about the natural world. And uh, I, I learned chemistry at school and stuff like that. How did you celebrate the accomplishment of receiving two prizes? Prizes, to me, they just happen because I, I'm... A, but, but not about doing what I do. I don't think they happen because of any other reason, uh, you know. I, I, and I can't, celebrating is hard. For, uh, uh, I, I, I tend to talk about the chemistry again or something. I guess I, 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 uh, I used to have more of these hobbies and things, but, but now I feel really pretty invested in this, this underworld that nobody sees that, that I think needs to be sort of excavated still and uh, so I try to do it the best I can and I should quit I should retire I, my wife I'm sure wishes I would she does and but I don't know what I'm through if I retire you know some people <laughs> just become a, everybody every, uh, become you pain in the neck after they retire yeah what do you think is the secret to success well you know it's it's being able to part of it's able to to see what's important not always, but most of the time you can, in another field, if you, if you have the kind of curiosity that's this, this dispersed curiosity, you can actually see things in other fields that apparently they don't see themselves. And then, you, uh, but the main thing is, how do, you, how do you tell whether your idea is worth anything or right or wrong? And that's the, that's the hardest part for anybody. But, but my, my way to do that was I try to kill it right away. If I have an idea that looks important or looks like, I try to get ideas where I can do a night or two's worth of work in the lab and show that it was baloney, you know, just kill it. I see something that's sort of, from what I've seen already, and I've seen it's implied that this thing, these several of these things will go over to that, will do something, they'll take them over this mountain and they'll show up over there and that'll be, uh, but... Maybe there's no way to get there, but 
if I test, uh, I can test it quickly sometimes. I can say, does it, does it or doesn't do that? And if it doesn't, it's dead. I forget about it. But if it comes back to me again a, month, a couple of months later, and the same thing is happening, hmm, I said, maybe I didn't get the answer to that. The subconscious is, is actually moving me around over the chemical terrain. It says, why did you come back? I said, why did you come back to me two years from ago? I thought of that. Why are you back there right now knocking at my door? And I, I, I say, well, maybe you deserve another chance. And some of the recent things we did were like that. What advice would you give to a student or young researcher? Be sure to be interested. If you're interested in something, you can, you can go many, many miles beyond exhaustion in, in trying to understand that if you're interested, you care. Uh, if you think you have to learn something, chances are you may have a lucky idea while you're doing it. But usually you have an idea while you're stretching and also learning reading outside your own field. I mean, if you're, the worst thing we have in these disciplines, they really don't exist in, in the real world. They only exist because of human mind imposed them and the history of education. Your former Professor Spencer taught you to think like a molecule. Can you explain what that means? I worry about what's going to go wrong. So when I think like a molecule, what I'm doing is being neurotic. I'm worried everything's going to go wrong that I can possibly imagine even more than I can imagine. So by doing that, when I run the reaction, I've gotten over 90% of the failures before I, I even start. Uh, and most people just take them, the failures roll over them continuously and they give up. That's what happens, I think, by thinking like a molecule. It's not, it's not something you're proud of, but it's... It's a way to worry about the environment that you're swimming through if you're a molecule. Can you tell us about the object that you're donating to the Nobel Prize Museum? When they make copper, we, we, I saw them up in the Andes, in Anafagasta, in, the, in, the, in Chile, a copper mine, and they're making copper on a megaton scale down there. And it's beautiful blue copper sulfate. And, and then you reduce it in, onto a, a, a big sheets by electricity, and it makes beautiful copper metal. You know, so pretty, uh, and that's how copper is made. And and uh, so, but in modern times, for auto bodies or whatever, they they take copper and make it into balls. They just let it cool in a ball, and they get a nice copper ball. And the ball weighs about uh, I don't know how many pounds, but it's about seven moles. And we just take these copper balls and you throw them into the anode and they plate onto the, the cathode. That's what they're for. But I, got, I sold them. I said, these would be great to have around just for fun. So I, I got 200 pound boxes of them and put them in flower, uh, in flower pots with, gently because they would crack the, but so right by my blackboard, I had a big flower pot of copper balls, about 200 pounds. And uh, I would just give them, to people on a whim, as it, because the copper reaction became so famous, it became a symbol. And then there's lots of people around the world who have copper paperweights, but they could use them for defense if they got attacked in their office, you know. Or <laughs> they could, in, in a modern building, you might need them to break the. Uh, I thought of them as good for breaking the plate glass so I could jump out of the second story window, but they're a symbol of copper's majesty. And I'll tell you a poem that maybe many people don't know, and I love this poem. It's. Uh, Rudyard Kipling, it says, uh, gold is for the mistress, silver is for the maid, copper is for the craftsman, cunning at his trade. What said the baron sitting in the hall? Iron, cold iron is master of them all.